Greetings, greetings. This is Body Culinary. Just coming in today for a quick share about the economics of edges and acne, particularly as a sun-kissed um, chocolate woman. So um, today, no, you're not going to see any gel um, on my hair. And if I did want to play with gel, I'm a, I, I like to homestead and create my own stuff. So most likely I will play with flaxseed gel. Um, but my edges are not slick. And sometimes when you just sit um, in appreciation at the, you know, perhaps at those moments in the early day or you get a break during the day and you're in quiet. And sometimes when you glance in the mirror and you just appreciate yourself or when there are moments that you're free of the, the pressure from social media and advertisement, um, you can sit and have some moments of clarity. And so I was just reasoning, as I often do, about the economics of black beauty, of chocolate beauty, of sun-kissed um, beauty, and how it is such uh, uh, an economy. Our, um, our lack of esteem, our insecurities, not feeling comfortable, not feeling chosen, how that is a tremendous stream of economics that's women in general. But in particular, black women um, not feeling comfortable in our own skin. It makes folks a lot of money. And so as someone that um, has traveled um, a bit and currently um, in Central America, I, um, I think about, particularly as I watch women, many women struggling to survive and look at the different economic brackets, who's been exposed and has been um, afforded an education, or even if they don't have a traditional education, if their families um, may have uh, certain businesses in the family or um, land in the family. I watch how women are surviving and thriving throughout the world. And also when I started to travel years ago, I'm always looking to see where am I you know, in the picture. Um, I enjoy life, I enjoy human beings, but at the same time, very realistically, I look to see where am I out in the world? Where are other women that look like me? Where are their mothers, where are their daughters? How are we flourishing out in the world? And I was just reasoning that um, there are many women, and I can see this in other countries, and you can see this in young girls, not just in the city, not just in the New York City ghetto. You can see many, you can see many um, young women sometimes. This is not all I see, but I do know sometimes you can see many young women looking very um, turned out at a young age. And it's no secret that many women will use um, their looks and their bodies um, to survive. And this is not to down those people at all, but this is just what I see. And sometimes I look at um, just the economics of it all, that when women either they're single or not married, or they're approaching an age where they have to be concerned about how they're going to eat, how their families are going to eat, um, even if they don't have children yet, or should they have um, culturally, um, they're in a position where they've had children at a young age. A lot boils down to women and the um, opportunities that they have to fend for themselves, to become educated, pursue um, endeavors um, or careers or skills that they like that can feed them. And so that just brings me to the economics of edges. You know, uh, in some of the stores here that sell beauty supply stores, and the stores are set up kind of differently here. Some of the stores um, can be very random. You can go in the store um, for a light bulb and come out with some interesting kind of food. It's just a mismatch of stuff. It feels like a surplus sometimes from the States. But you can find the little small jars of hair gel um, from the small amounts of folks and um, chocolate folks um, and sun-kissed folks from the States, you know, usually um, African-Americans. You know, shea butter is kept coveted over here, right? Where we may have more access to it coming in um, being imported in um, in the States. We have a lot more beauty supply stores. Of course, primarily, it's not us um, owning the beauty supply stores, but there are a few of us that own um, beauty supply stores, um, people of color. And so when I look at the pricing um, of a small jar like this of hair gel, and when I researched it online, I see that some of the popular brands, are, one of them is Cream of Nature. I'm familiar with that brand and some of the other brands. But when you look at the cost, 
for a little small jar of gel, you can spend about $9 or more. And some of the cheaper Echo Styler gels that you'd find in the beauty supply store um, over in the States, you can find it at some of the, um, some of the uh, Asian shops um, over here. And of course, people have to pay a lot of money for the duty and the pricing. But my point is, this is something, this here is very, very unique. The, the Afro marker is a very, very unique marker with different textures and so on. But things that we do to care for our hair, especially when it comes to our hair being pain-free and to be versatile with styling it from hair bobbles and accessories to hair gels and all this stuff is a tremendous market. And so it's interesting that not just quote unquote, if we think of the black or the, the chocolate community, but also that women that are, sh that quite often are struggling in the world to make men uh, ends meet and to even pay for their education or pay for other opportunities or be afforded the opportunity to travel. Things that we use um, are a source of economics that siphons out of um, our community. It siphons out of the community of the people that need it and use it. Um, toilet paper, cell phones, batteries, those are things that all communities use. And um, as women, especially as black um, American women and, and uh, folks from the from the, the Afro diaspora of the American ex experience um, have been trying to find and struggling with finding a footing economically for a long time. And um, it sometimes it just occurs to me that Shea butter is one. A lot of that is coming from the continent. But there are things that perhaps we can make, and I'm just putting this out there. I can't do everything on my own. But I'm just there's a I'm saying there's a definite economics um, to our beauty and to us not feeling comfortable in our skin and the things that we use to beautify um, ourselves. And I encourage, I can't come up with everything, but I encourage folks to take a look at um, certain um uh the industries of the things that we use often. Um, some things that we'll use are uh, mascara. I recently came across a, a, a black owned vegan makeup company. Um, it's no secret that a lot of people now um, are ordering uh, cosmetics um, in bulk from companies and then can put their name or their label on it. None of those things are wrong, but I encourage folks to think of a share economy and um, an economy, if nothing else, so that we can flourish and so that we can see um, ourselves the benefactors of this unique um, experience and not have everybody profit off of it. And then, um, you know, we don't have a say necessarily in the safety of the products that are marketed towards us or um, institutions that are built around our hair care, which is um, unique to Afro culture. And that's uh, folks of the diaspora world over, but I'm also definitely speaking as a um, as um, someone from the Afro American experience. This is a huge source of economics for folks, and the economics primarily are not coming um, from us. Now, I will say, and I definitely have to acknowledge that um, social media and the YouTube platform has been a tremendous opportunity and has skyrocketed the conversation around natural hair. You have a lot more. Um, women of color doing shea butters and washes and um, sulfate free and chemical free um, products that are catered for our hair that doesn't strip our hair and that um, puts pictures of us on the bottles. Um, I just think that there's um, a lot more that we can expound um, upon to make sure that we are cared for and taken care of that the things that we need can foster economics. And um, sometimes we can have a tendency to just think of other people, their religious communities or their ethnic groups, but definitely this stamp and this, um, this experience of this Afro textured here, there, I just think there are a lot of possibilities for it to be able to feed us, right? So that as I look outside and I see um, some women in other um, uh, countries and even in the States that don't see possibilities um, for generating economics. Um, they may not have the, the money in other, other countries to go to quote unquote school. Not everybody can af afford it, um, to afford it. However, at the same time, there are people that have businesses and have flourishing businesses, um, that don't necessarily have a traditional education. So I think, um, I just want to stimulate, um, 
the conversation because it's very um, concerning when I see um, not just young people, but also women of my own age. Women that sometimes, if I could just be frank, sometimes will um, sell their, their bodies in order to feed themselves or their children or feel like they have to get into certain kinds of relationships in order to eat or to be afforded the opportunity to travel or the things that we'll have to put up with um, in order to have access to economics. And so when I look at the very things that we're born with, like this hair, um, you know, for us to spend $10, $15 and up for a jar of edge control, slate edges and edge control, is, is just, it's such opportunity and possibility there. There's a, a whole economics around us um, not feeling um, beautiful. And it's like, um, it's like we're always chasing uh, something being dangled, a carrot being dangled um, in front of us. So if we get more beautiful, if we put 20 layers of makeup on, then then we can, now we can enter the arena to compete for the very, very rich men or the men that will finally take us out on a date or give us some attention. It's so many layers of, of, of stuff. And so I make a choice and, you know, I love grooming. Um, and, and I, I stop and I sit in um, appreciation of my unique presence that I popped out onto the, the planet with. It's not to say that I can't play and groom, but I make a conscious purposeful, um, I, may, I, I take a stance with myself more than for other people to just sit in appreciation and wonderment because in corporate America, I might be looked at as funny with this hair or somebody might say, um, why don't you do your hair? You need to slick down those edges. And even if nothing is said, even I can be subject to feeling like, um, wow, my hair doesn't look like, like other people's. It's not slick. It's not tamed. It doesn't have these defined curls when this is just what the hair is. This is what it does. I don't know if we um, often just sit and I call it kind of like a meditation or a noticing, a relaxation in this is it. This is what the hair does. It does what it wants to do. It's not that we don't care for it and groom it and appreciate it, but we don't sit in the wonderment um, that is us. And uh, another side of that is in, um, in the world, quite often the wonderment, the wonderment that is uniquely ours sometimes is only seen as um, a sexual object or something to quickly be conquered or to be experienced. So I just um, would like to contribute to the conversation and stimulate folks to think about the economics, how much money this, these edges and this quote unquote unruly hair that in many cases might not be um, accepted or looked upon um, from conditioning as anything beautiful. It generates billions of dollars of wealth for people. This, um, this hair, this hair, did these puffy edges, you know, and trying to make our hair do things that obviously it's not designed to do. I'm not talking about creative expression, but in terms of what this hair is designed to do, it has a, a purpose. We don't sit in a, in a wonderment of it and a, re, a respect and a celebration of it. And so um, basically our insecurities get pimped out. <laughs> and how could these edges or the, 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 the flaxy gels that many women are making or the education, how could that benefit us? There was a woman that I said, and I, you know, everything is perspective. I really am, I love education. I'm definitely a lifelong learner. And yesterday I saw something on YouTube. I, I really enjoy YouTube because I can see some girls farming in China. It's not even in, um, in English. And I really appreciate the access to information. But anywho, I saw this woman, uh, a black woman, um, lighter skin. Um, I don't know if I want to say, look like the, the inside of an almond with, with some more brown and her hair color. Was interesting. Another shade of brown or, or, or light brown on the, on the spectrum. But anyway, she's a breast cancer survivor, and she did a workshop um, in English and French with all these French girls. And we know we have a lot of women in the diaspora that um, are of mixed heritage, and then some sisters that were darker African. Um, and they were all together in this workshop around their hair, just young women. And I was so really touched because I was like, wow, I was thinking that's me. That's something I would do, something I've envisioned for many years. And this woman basically taught these young girls how to 
take care of their hair. And um, the young girls got to do each other's hair and um, experiment with putting the twists in each other's hair and um, putting a gel and, you know, the, the emblem on the woman's, um, on her products. She had a, a little black salon. It was written in French, an Afro salon. And um, the imagery looked like, you know, chocolate folks with the hair texture. And they got to experience their different hair textures and come up with hairstyles. Well, all these, um, these young girls, um, 11, 12, I think, I think they were 11, 12, maybe one thirteen. but, um, you could see the expressions on their face. You could see the innocence and these young girls, you could see, um, that they had not fully come into their own, that they felt, um, awkward, not confident. Um, pretty much most all of them said that they don't wear their hair down, um, they all could um, resonate with each other in terms of styling our hair is very uncomfortable and can be painful. Many out you, I'm sure, can relate to that. Um, getting your head, you know, I know for me, I remember getting my, my hand popped with the comb when I would just complain that um, the comb was hurting my hair. And I, although I love um, being a loose natural, when my hair got to a certain length, especially as someone that has very fine, not dense, Afro textured hair, the amount of breakage, even with spending on the best comb and tangle teasers and all of that stuff, it just became more and more challenging to detangle. That's actually how I came came to have locks. I didn't intend on having locks, but in traveling and um, not using products, my hair kept tangling. So, I mean, me trying to pick it out with a safety pin, I finally just gave up and just let the hair do what it does. And that's how I wound up with locks. And it's like going natural all over again because my hair is so fine. It's not black. It's constantly like, it does, it, it has its own unique um, presence and we don't sit in wonderment of it. So anyway, the, this woman, the shop owner did a workshop with these young women. They got to style each other's hair, twist, um, define their curls. Even one um, a young girl with um, kinkier textured hair to experience her curl definition. These young girls, the light on their face um, as they experience their own beauty and a confidence and as the, the woman who reframed um, the narrative around their hair and even um, pointed out to them when they were referring negatively to their hair and gave them another perspective in which to view their hair, I was like, wow, it really touched me. And this woman, um, she actually is also a breast cancer survivor. So at one point she had lost all of, of her hair. You know, um, so she said um, it was really challenging, but it was also a blessing. So that just really, really um, touched me and touched my, touch, it just touched my, my, my essence, my, my soul inside to watch these girls, um, these young girls. And you would hear them, you know, talk about their aspirations, what sports they like, what music groups they like. They're just young girls. And so for them to feel the confidence and see the possibilities that, of what they could do, the different things they could do with their own hair, and for them to be educated, right? When I was coming up, there was still a time where um, many um, of the older women, after a while, they got tired of, of straightening your hair and you complaining about getting your ears burnt, you know, and buying the hair greases and things that didn't have pictures of us on the jars of hair grease. Um, now there are pictures of, of us on the jars, but quite often the economics is still going outside. Um, but they got tired of doing your hair. And then when they got tired of it, then they put a, a chemical in it. And I remember my whole scalp being scalded. So there are times where I just really sit in it. I sit and steep myself in the wonderment and the appreciation of my unique um, presence without anything on my skin. And I can appreciate it now because I had acne um, before someone I was eating very healthy, but I had to pay for all the things I ate all those many years ago. So sitting in the wonderment and the appreciation of a skin tone, well, we don't really necessarily need layers and layers of color, right? We have a natural tan. Um, when we're very hydrated. We don't really need any kind of thing on our lips. I'm not telling people what to do, but I'm just saying as you just sit in the wonderment that is your unique presence, that we don't need um, to do to slick down um, our edges. Now, we can be creative but it's a source of economics. It's a possibility for unique economics. And it is definitely a possibility for a culture and a standard that can really um, feed us and feed these young women so that um, women don't have to, and young girls don't have to be turned out for money um, because many women can't see 
the possibility for economics, right? Because we're always going to pay to get our, our um, hair done. And as, as and it's so funny, this woman watching her do this just sparked a vision I've had for many years of, you know, uh, us having salons and hair care salons and grooming salons and fashion salons, things that are coming from in-house. Um, it's, it's a way that we can feed ourselves and it's a way that we can um, share information. Um, it's a way that we can share um, possibilities and uplift ourselves um, in a very organic way. All this from all these possibilities from these puffy, unslicked um, edges because a jar, a small jar of gel. And if you want it organic without chemicals, you're going to pay even more for that gel. You can even sniff a little jar of edge control. Think about it. Edge control to control your hair and make it look like something is a billion dollar business. You know, so I invite us to be creative and to think about the possibilities and at, just at a basic level to sit in appreciation sometimes and perhaps just let the hair be. Um, experiment with styles that accommodate what the hair does, that accommodate the frizziness, that accommodate your um, very fragile um, hairline that is telling you and showing you that it does not want to be pulled on. And um, hair accessories that don't leave us in a lot of pain. Uh, finding quote unquote solutions or things that work for our unique presence that has a unique stamp on it has tremendous possibilities um, hey, greetings. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I just think of the possibilities because um, I make an effort to choose my words carefully, but sometimes just when I look at uh, young girls and women feeling so such a lack of confidence that we spend a tremendous amount of money, sometimes economics um, that may not be in a, a, a viable spending plan or in a quote unquote budget that some people before um, they're able to eat Around the globe, there's a pressure to buy outfits, to be chosen, you know, for what? It's like somehow the economic puzzle isn't making sense. And I've seen women and young girls are, um, around the world sell their bodies or be exploited um, or somebody wanting to bed or sleep with this. But it doesn't mean our respect or it doesn't mean that we're able to flourish with, with economics, because although we talk about spirituality and put bindi in cowboy shells, economics is a reality of life. And it's really, you know, just like we, we praise um, STEM research and folks going into the sciences, beauty, and it's a conversation, it's always a conversation around beauty, but there's a lot of conversation today about um, hypergamy, or it seems like we're always looking for a way out that um, if we're not being chosen, quote unquote, um, by our men, then maybe this group of men will want us from this culture or that group of men may want us, you know? And if we can find a way to um, creative ways that speak to our unique presence to support ourselves, I think it can go a long way in um, Afro women being able to secure ourselves economically, definitely as an African-American, an Afro-American woman, an Afro woman of the American ex experience without getting caught up in the semantics. Um, at the end of the day, um, the young girls uh, and the young women are looking at us and they need a way to survive and to feed themselves. Young men too, but right now I'm speaking in terms of beauty and the, the culture um, of beauty and, um, and also health. Is the economics is important and we have a unique, um, we have a unique presence which plays into our unique culture, um, which in our culture can feed us without being dogmatic or without being cultish. It can feed us and it can feed these young women if we start to reframe the narrative. And so I, am, I invite folks to sit, to take the time to sit in the things that you may consider or the challenges or the things that um, perhaps society or you grew up, if you listen to your own language, thinking is not attractive about you. That's your open bite or your nostrils. I remember when I was little, I used to try to suck my nose in and think I wanted to be like Michael Jackson. The reality is we are affected by the music and the celebrities and the people that we hold in esteem. And we're trained and, and trained by um, our mothers and um, the women in society. We're um, 
we're groomed for what we think is acceptable in the workplace and what's going to be attractive and how we should fix our hair. This new generation is being much more experimental that at a baseline, I really think there's um, even much more of a tremendous opportunity for our unique presence and these edges and um, our beauty in a way that is not toxic to us, that our culture, this Afro culture can feed us and, um, and feed our young women. You know, if they see us, see us creating even more products, right? So let's, let's say, for example, what, what possibly could that look like? We've got lots of shea butter. We've got more washes. Now we've got sulfate-free shampoos. What else are we saying that we kings and queens all stuff? Just creative people as unique people with a lot of rhythm. What can, what, what can we create? I pose, and I'm an idea person, a share economy. Share economy is something that you can research, not a new concept. But if we can think of what kind of other ideas of other kinds of products, if that's a gel. So I know me as someone that likes and enjoys um, living foods, whole living unprocessed foods. If I make um, herbal teas and rinses, for example, if you look on this channel, you'll see um, and kind of like my alternative to rose water. I just have this thing that I should have access to, to fresh food. So I, I am the person, if I'm eating something, I'm going to plant it to see if it grows. Um, the rose water, constantly, if you have to order it on Amazon, and if you have to go outside your community to another community to, to purchase it, I'm like, okay, I deal with food um, all the time. I've put food on my face and my hair and skin to clear up acne, right? And it's the catcher. When you're working with things that are natural, they don't have a shelf life. So the shelf life and the packaging and the marketing is what can often is going to lead to the profit. However, if in our unique um, communities, right, with this unique Afro experience, if we could come, well, not, uh, I said it was a $90 hair bonnet. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. A $90 hair bonnet. Okay, I'm just going to take it another level. A $90 hair bonnet, and we have women, black women and black girls, black women, Afro women of all different shades, you know, in between Latina, Dominica, Puerto Rican, all of this. There are women that are staying in abusive relationships because of economics. But we buy a $90 hair bonnet. And wherever I've gone on the, around the world, you can find bleaching cream. You can find dangerous chemicals and perms, lightning creams, straighteners, but yet you find folks struggling to take their last money sometimes to buy an outfit to look attractive. There's tremendous opportunity there for us to be healthy. And um, one of the things that can contribute to our health, go with me here, is economics. Healthy economics that has some kind of a standard to it where we're not exploited. Well, we can write the narrative and we can determine what is going to be the standard as the mothers, whether children come through your womb or not. We are mamas at a certain age, right, of responsibility. The children are looking and the young women are looking at us. And if we're not comfortable in our skin, they're going to take a cue from us. And if we don't develop any industries, right? If we think of cottage industries, right? As someone that's a chef, cottage industries would be things like um, champagne. Champagne is only considered champagne if you buy it from the champagne region of France. Or um, as someone that's worked with gourmet olive oils and sold them for years, um, many years, um, gourmet olive oils, the AOC Appellation of Control, they have certain standards for the olives, right? For certain expensive olives, they can't drop on the ground. The trees have to be planted a certain amount of um, space apart and how they're harvested. Can you see the parallels and the possibilities for, for how we can apply those principles to the things that are going to be used on our bodies and the way that we feed ourselves, right? At some point, all, you know, women buy the groceries. At some point, we stir the pot. Who stirs the pot controls the house. And also, who's administering the beauty and teaching about beauty? Beauty is, is, it inspires us. It is a, it's a tool. I would also say our biggest beauty product is health. Health is our biggest beauty product. We're spending so much money to cover up acne and acne scars where, and it's a panic and it's an anxiety. Whereas if we could take the time to invest somewhat in some kind of education, a reintroduction to the ways of our grandmothers, understanding how to use 
basic food as medicine. I'm not saying we have to go on the level of pharmaceutical company, but understanding how to use food as medicine and how to use the fresh, whole, unprocessed ingredients out just in my humble experience. Um, and as someone that spent so much money in the health food store on products and um, used to purchase proactive, I was all a natural girl and this and that, but when that acne and that scarring got to a certain point, in my in my experience, that was very painful. It was uncomfortable. I felt very embarrassed. Um, I would have given all the muscle that I had, and somebody was had a very fit body when I was competing and working out many more hours a day, just to have clear skin. So all that to say that um, us not feeling confident and not being healthy is costing us whole fresh living unprocessed foods also that is cruelty free first to our own breasts our brain our lymphatic system cruelty free i invite you go with me here i'm just giving some insight into um my thought process cruelty free first to our own body temples right and then to the environment around us it's a mentality that has so much leverage and so much possibilities to feed us and to generate um, economics. Because this fluffy here, folks, everybody's getting paid off of it. Yeah, I can go around in other countries and I can see that um, a lot of women and girls can't figure out how to feed themselves or um, possibilities to create a business and, and who are their, um, their customers, their clients. So I invite you um, con to contribute to the conversation. I'm an idea person. One person cannot do it all and burn themselves out. But I think a good, simple place, and I invite you to um, to explore sitting, sitting with your hair and not um, running away from it. I remember when I was coming up, there was a time when you saw any little bit of a kink, you ran out and you got more perm. You got more creamy crack and slathered it on. I remember back in the day, <laughs> in the hood, where, and I laugh now, but I remember folks, if you had this much hair, folks were slicking that sucker down with um, with hair grease to get a, a ponytail. And the slightest little bit of any kind of kink or fluff, any of this that would come out, it had to be, forget slicking down edges. It had to be permed, it had to be burned, it had to be straight in order for you to feel acceptable to the point there was really nothing of a ponytail left. I swear, if I had known about some free form, or if it had occurred to me to do some free form locks on natural back then, I would have done it just for the, the relief and not being um, so um, anxious, which can also lead to depression. If you really think about it, us not being comfortable in our skin, it contributes to depression, which can contribute to us eating a whole lot of food mindlessly as a response to stress and anxiety, the anxiety, like a primal anxiety. I'm going to be alone. I'm not going to be chosen. I'm not attractive. All of that coming from here. So I invite folks to just um, sit, sit in the essence of your unique presence of how you popped out onto this earth plane. We popped out, we popped out onto this earth plane with unique blueprint and experience. And I would say uh, it's interesting. Most of the world, I would say, finds us finds this um, attractive in terms. You let me know. You'll get feedback and um, and more compliments when it's natural. But I've also found we can be very um, objectified and looked at as sexual objects. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people want to share the profits of our sexualization or the the profits that come from the beauty industry with our community. I mean, just look at some. And I'm not even making these folks wrong, right? Let's say if we look at a lot of who the, the beauty supply stores are owned by. So what I'm saying, rather than be against something, what can we come up with creatively where we can foster a share economy and not just share, not just free, but an economy and a system of economics that feeds folks with this unique stamp with this unique Afro stamp so that we can flourish and so that we don't have to go around the world and watch many of our women being pimped out and hold out because of a lack of um, self-esteem, um, feel like they're not gonna be chosen, feel like they have to stay in um, less than ideal um, relationships or expose themselves um, prematurely to, um, to sex. 
because we don't feel attractive and because we don't have um, a way to generate economics, right? We can't see uh, what industry that we can get into um, that doesn't have us compromise ourselves, right? I'm going to capitalize and teach each other white men are there for our hair texture. Wow. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't have read the comments. I live in a predominantly white area. The moms have mixed children. They don't know how to care for their hair. All right, your highness. Right. So what can we come up with again? This, this video that I had seen, if, if folks said it came later, maybe can um, look uh, to early in the video when I shared this woman that um, is a survivor of breast cancer, um, that education, um, she opens her shop to educating young girls. And I'm, and I'm thinking she's doing something I thought about years ago. Um, and another example, oh, what is this book? One of my favorite, one of my favorite black hair care books. There are a couple of them that I had that I just read them over and over. You might have your favorite books like that. Back in the day, my favorite books were Heal Thyself and No Lie by Talani Kennard. Shout out to Talani Kennard. She was one of the founders of the National Braiders Guild. So maybe some of the new folks in the natural hair community may not be familiar, but the way that um, I learned about it, and she had a salon in her house, the most stunning braids I have ever had in my life, pain-free, the smell, the essence, her, I mean, I can't say enough about her. Talani Kennard also sang with um, Sweet Honey in the Rock. Um, also, she and her husband or a model... Um, couple in the black community, community activists, and so on. Just um, artistic, supporting young people, and so on. Anyway, most beautiful braids that you have ever seen that was so teeny, 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 tiny. And it had beads on them. Very distinct style. You can tell anybody that um, has been trained by Talani Kennard. And I'm trying to think of the shop that I also went to on Washington Avenue. When she transitioned, she had a shop in her brownstone. Um, and you know, many black women who's who I can think of went to her salon and she was also training young girls. Those um, young women went on to, oh, why can't I think it's on a tip of something creation, new wave cultural creation. Shout out to them um, on Washington Avenue in Brooklyn. Just the, the standard of the hair oils, no pain on your hair, um, taking their time with your hair, the cleanliness of the shop, standards. High, high, high um, standards. But um, back to the National Braiders Guild. Um, so some folks may not be aware that there was a movement many years ago to try to have you have to pay to cornrow your hair, something which is your cultural birthright. Um, I think if that had gone over, then we would have to pay to do braids in a, in a salon, right? And then you would have to go through the whole cosmetology curriculum in order for you to be able to do hair. So way before th this, um, some of the current stuff that's going on with laws in terms of braids and locks in the military, there was the, um, nat the National Braiders Guild. And from what I understand, Talani Kennard um, was a, a trailblazer. And there were also other um, women that were trailblazers back in the day that many of us may have never, um, I get chills when I think about it, may have never heard of. And these women are very um, regal in their dress and their presentation, how they carry themselves and always having cultural nuances around their hair, um, standards for how they raise their children into health and affirmations. And they knew each other and went to juicing and fasting. And I mean, really doing it on a, um, a very attractive, if you will, um, level. So shout out to Talani Kennard and that book. Some of you may have it if you have any of your natural hair care books that were sold on the, in the black bookstores on the book table. Um, no lie. And um, she took the time to um, talk about detangling your hair and detangling um, your daughter's hair and things like that. So if we bring that up to date, why can't we uh, create something where we create a whole economy around educating folks that have mixed children on their hair? I had a client or uh, I had a client or someone I work with and I'm training folks in a high end gym that had um, adopted black children. And they wanted some insight on doing the girl's hair because they had always liked the twist and the way that I would do my hair. And they said, wow, I'd love for my daughter, their black daughter. They were very white, very European, pleasant. But they wanted their daughter to know how to do their hair. And they asked me, you know, what I mind. So that's a whole potential um, economy purchased both from Black and Noble. Yeah, I'm familiar. I've heard of Black and Noble. 
And Zora, I have a masticating juice, a juice, organic, ginger root, turmeric, and uh huh, face mask. Yes, and Zora, I love, I'm the, I, I can't even tell you how many juices I've had. I'm one of those people, I love juicers um, more than I love furniture. Mm, I suffer from cystic acne and hyperpigmentation. That was me. Um, natural ladies relates to beauty. Um, yeah, and I, that was horrible for me to feel like I had to put plastic on. Like just when my skin was clogged, and I'm someone that went to a finishing went to finishing school at one point, a black finishing school, and I remember the woman, and I hear where she was coming from, telling me that makeup protects your skin, but for me, and I'm not saying that she was wrong, but it just never resonated with me as someone that had clogged pores that I got to put makeup on to protect my skin, particularly when I've seen both of my great grandmothers have beautiful skin, no makeup. If anything, they use lard and Vaseline back in the day. But a, a distinction and a pattern that I can see was that they ate their own food. My Bijan grandmother ate her own food. She said, if I want garbage, I mean, you own garbage. She ate her own food. She would take the old bread bags. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the old ba bread bags, the little twist ties, and they used to have a plastic clip. Those were her Ziploc bags. And she would whip out her food on a, um, a bus ride. That's the Bajan side. And then my Southern grandmother, they had liniment and peppermint and herbs and all this stuff in jars all on the book bookshelves that my grandpa on the southern side of my family had built. But they still had Sunday dinners. That was before, um, you know, all this expensive stuff. They weren't eating all this, the cereals out of the box. Even cornflakes were more expensive. I still remember those days. Um, a big splurge was if they ate um, grits and, you know, other stuff. But they couldn't afford you know, so be without jumping all the way back to Africa, I can say in my current lifetime, I remember home cooked food on the both sides of my black Afro experience. And I see a big difference in those women um, in their health. The next generation underneath, um, when my grandmas had um, passed away, a lot of the family traditions had died. So people didn't want to come together for the family, quote unquote, barbecues, uh, gatherings when um, those women, those elder women, when they pass. So all that's to come back and to say, you know, there's a whole lot of um, economics around these edges being slayed, even to slay the edges, to control the edges, control edges. I think that's definitely one of the um, the attractions today to semi freeform um, locks is because it's just what I call radical, I'll call it radical self-acceptance. And it has been an exercise. There have been times where, um, even though I've been natural for like going on about 30 years or return to natural, cause I'm natural as a, as a little girl, maybe up until, um, third or fourth grade, it was when I begged my mother for a perm. And then after high school, um, I went natural. I returned to natural. So we say go natural. We're really returning to um, our natural state. So it's really quite a doozy and a psycho psychosis that's that's put on us around not being able to sit, to sit in the essence of this is what it is. This is what it does. And that's why I say radical self acceptance and to celebrate it. You know, to adorn it in ways that don't hurt. I'm very tender headed. Um, any kind of pulling on his hair, it hurts. And so we're putting ourselves in a lot of pain um, in order to address this, this um, anxiety, this anxiety to, um, to feel attractive, where that has, that's a choice for many women of choosing to sit um, and be attractive and accept their attractiveness and accept um, our unique presence. And I would say, and just another phase of it is us for us to explore the possibilities of a of an economy that circulates, right? Because all of us chocolate women, or some of us may have, you know, um, mixed children or have mixed children in our family, um, different textures of hair. Um, if our young women can't see um, economics to feed themselves and also to flourish on a whole nother. Um, level from something that is a unique stamp and birthright. Um, I think we, we're missing out on possibilities and we can go to school and we can study for everyone else, but someone, maybe not everybody, everybody has to do something different. We need our researchers. We need, um, you know, our scientists and our astronauts, our women scientists and creators, but there's, we spend money on this all the time. And it's a, a tremendous amount of energy and resources that 
are leached out. And so I invite folks to contribute to the conversation of how can we recirculate um, that energy, that confidence, that real time economics so that um, we other women, right? Our age too, because it's not just the young women. We got to be concerned also about us, our generation, as well as the, the girls and the young women coming um, underneath us. Um, the possibilities for feeding ourselves off of our unique Afro stamp. And this is obviously bled into our culture. So we can rewrite um, the narrative, right? I'm big on uh, rewriting the narrative that we get to say, we get to say what's attractive and what's not. And if we really take a stand, the possibilities for what will become attractive. I mean, can you imagine a day when Frizz is attractive and it the, the, the script is flipped where people's like, oh my gosh, what did you do to your edges? They're so slick. I'm not saying we want to be divisive, but can you imagine if the, if that was turned on its head and this instead was the standard? What would that take? What kind of paradigm shift um, would that take? Let me see what else folks are saying in here. My locks are semi free form and low maintenance and simple, right? Um, yeah, so this is um, semi free form. And a lot of it is just because of the functionality of it, you know, because it doesn't hurt. You know, I could come up with all these styles and very creative. I love to play in my hair. But, you know, can anybody out there relate to the head wrap headache? You know, when you're back in there, you pull your head wrap too tight or you got your um, Afro puff too tight and you have a headache. It's like if you think about it, it's kind of um, astounding that we subject ourselves to so much discomfort to go out and parade and pump before um, other people. We put ourselves at, um, at risk in terms of our health and just feeling super uncomfortable and even in pain. And we're not even profiting um, economically off of um, our unique presence. So <laughs> that's what I just wanted to share about today. I encourage um, women to um, explore um, health because health is the ultimate beauty product. Um, should you groom yourself and play around with makeup? That's something that women do. We, we're creative with colors and flowers and scents. Um, but also our health. If we're healthy, there's a lot you just don't need. You don't need to necessarily buy more, a bigger size wardrobe and you don't need as much clothes. Um, some of us can be made feel like it's a drag to exercise. Um, but dancing to me is not like exercise, right? I love African dance and then all other fitness came for me from there. And I invite you to think of um, preparing your food as a way to spend good quality time um, with yourself where it's fun and it's, it's, it's relaxing. That's something, a personal practice that um, I've had for years. And so what people would say, don't you ever do this and don't you do that? And I would think like, um, they would think I was missing out on certain treats and I would think that they are missing out because I really um, can, can sit into a calm of me cleaning my kitchen and my juicer and taking my time to prepare my food and make it attractive. So by the time I open it later in the day, it's still attractive. And I have been able to do this um, with fresh food um, for some years, and I, I'd rather invest in my food as healthcare, um, as my insurance to avoid the doctor's office unless I needed to, needed to go there, but something my goal is to stay out of there. So um, I invite folks to reframe the narrative around what takes so much time and um, look at the time that you nourish and oil your skin and massage your scalp and prepare your fresh food and that you carve out time, even initially if there's 20 or 30 minutes of really good um, self-care, um, how it leverages out over time and how you get the benefit of better mood from taking care of yourself and preparing your food and appreciating your hair and the confidence that you cultivate for yourself when you become confident you know, I remember one time I, I stopped wearing all jewelry. I would say, so maybe on the last year I put my earrings on. But for me, not saying you have to do this, I took everything off. I took off um, no mascara. Every now and then I would like mascara, but no mascara, no earrings, no nothing. Um, and it was very uncomfortable. I was interested. I did a little self-experiment. I was addicted even to wearing earrings. And for me, I just wanted to experience myself in the raw and get very comfortable. Several weeks ago, you know, I did an experiment where I tried on some makeup and I felt like a clown 
for me. I'm not saying that maybe I could do a photo shoot one time in the, the future or whatever. I'm not condemning or putting myself in the box. But for me, I felt so artificial. I felt uncomfortable in about almost 100 degrees with, with makeup on. Um, I felt like a clown. I felt like a clown. I did not feel comfortable. I just did not. I did not like it. So that's been my personal experience. So it's a wonderful thing to take the time and you get to say what your narrative and your standard um, is. And um, I'm for one, I take, I take my, my power, I've taken my power back <laughs> a long time. This has been a long ongoing process to where I can just sit in a comfortability with myself. Where I like um, what I see when I look in the mirror, you know, and I'll be, um, I'll be the big five up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people say you shouldn't tell that. Whatever, I don't say all the time, but um, I really like what I see when I look in the mirror. And yes, the reality is there are going to be wrinkles. Um, having breastfed and had a child at home, the texture of your breast changes. Your hair texture is going to change. Um, different things with your cycle is going to change. But just to sit in an acceptance, not only in an acceptance, but in a celebration, where you could really get to a point where you have a um a quiet, confident smile because you like what you see when you look in the mirror and you don't have, to, not only do you not have to hide anything, you're like, this is pretty cool. I like this. I like the way it feels. I don't have to slick my edges. If you want to make some flaxseed gel, you can experiment with that too. But I don't have to compromise myself or I don't have to compromise my health to impress other people. And when you have that kind of feeling about yourself, it, it really, it's not corny. If it does that, whatever. It does radiate to other people. Real confidence irradiates. It's not even a cockiness. It's a it's a surety. It's a relaxation. It's definitely a relaxation and a confidence. That relaxation also, I swear, it can really carry over into your food choices. A lack of confidence and anxiety can really contribute to us eating mindlessly. I'll go on and on and on and on. <laughs> uh, I'm a critical care registered nurse. I believe in holistic care of my body. Nature's panacea. Well. Yeah. And the thing that is so, such a relief is so simple. It's when we say natural, it is literally natural. Like when I first cut my hair off years and many years ago out of um, high school, I have never felt so beautiful. It was like, I get chills when I think of it. I was looking in the mirror like, oh my gosh, I was like, that's me. And I, the revelation was, I don't have to do anything to myself. I don't have to do anything to be beautiful. And I got so many, so many compliments. But even without the compliments, I felt stunning. I felt beautiful. If this was all to fall off and break off, I feel beautiful and stunning with, with no hair. I've tried going bald. I've done peach fuzz. I've cut all different kinds of designs in my hair. Oh my gosh. I was like, you couldn't pay me to go back to the pain of the, my scalp being scalded, my ears being burnt, um, the anxiety around running to the beauty supply store to buy more perm, which contributes to fibroid tumors. It's like, you just couldn't pay me to do it. And I'm not here to, um, to preach to folks because everyone, folks, everyone is having their own experience. I can only contribute my simple um, experience to, um, the, the conversation and share my experience, but um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. And yes, now I want to feel I'm having my um, long hair experience because my hair is very shrunken. I've got this really delicate cottony hair that shrinks down to no matter how long it grows, it shrinks down to here. And so now I'm having my lock experience, but I could go shorter at uh, any time because I really feel like I have versatility. If I even had little knots, some people say I can wear that because I'll have knots in my head. I could do whatever um, I want to do because it's a, just like fashion, it's a form of um, expression. Um, I don't feel pressured to buy a whole bunch of um, clothes. I just don't feel that pressure um, anymore. I can buy something um, that's um, vintage. You know, I bought some beautiful stuff. I've gotten rid of most of my stuff and I've got some beautiful stuff for $2, $5. I've had some expensive pieces that I've had for years, but it's not the clothes that make me, which is why I will always say that health is your biggest beauty product. In any event, I'm just going live and giving you folks um, a shout out um, from Central America. Do subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed um, the content. I really appreciate the opportunity that um, is social media 
to connect around something that is positive or to perhaps um, have folks um, enjoying those folks that are interested in learning how to garden or do a beginner garden. garden. Um, those are some of the possibilities that lie within social media. So you can um, you can follow along if you'd like to see what I'm doing in my garden, um, playing with my hair and, and my living foods, um, food prep area and kitchen um, on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook. Um, what else I got going on? So I do have a $25 Treat Yourself Royal Thanksgiving challenge. Thanksgiving in the context of giving thanks to this one and only body temple. So um, one of the recent videos that I uploaded was a food haul. So that's $25 US. Keep in mind that whatever environment that you're in, um, you're most likely going to find a different variation on the foods that are available and also the season that you're in. If you buy seasonally though, you're more likely to get better flavor and get better um, bargains. So I invite you to use um, a food co-op. I love the, I even put my membership on freeze when I left the States because I really, I got so much benefit out of the um, food co-op um, over there in Brooklyn and then also the farmer's markets. And I invite you to develop relationships with your farmers. That's how I get a lot of good deals or some of the, the growers may put certain stuff in, in my bag because I'm actually interested um, in the food. Some people would even laugh at me, but just like in the traditions of my grandmother, if I go to the market, it's going to be those grandmamas that tell me how to pick this, how to pick that. That one's not good. Share with me the different things that they do with the foods. So that's the channel. That's the channel that I'm on. That is my thought process. It is a different process. It's a different way of approaching and thinking about food um, as opposed to, oh, I'm manic. I've got to lose weight. I've got to drink. You know, it's a different way of thinking of it. I like to think it's the way of the of the grandmothers, right? learning how to take all that fresh, unprocessed food and how can you um, be creative with it. Um, I have created um, a couple of books. One, if you'd like to share my hair journey as well as see um, some of the concoctions that I'm making with just food, right? Not even stuff in the shower caddy, not even products from the health food store. But if you'd like to see how I cleared up my um, skin and what are some of the different things that I've used on my hair and skin from the living foods I'm eating, uh, I'm a, I've created one book called um, Natural um, Natural Beauty No Products, Love Your Own Hair and Skin. It's cruelty-free and vegan. Not saying that you have to be, but that's just been my experience. So again, the paradigm I'm coming from is cruelty-free, first to your own body temple. And then another book, which is not a recipe book. Um, it's a book that has, it's called um, Whole Living Foods in the Hood, Part 1 with menus to fit your budget. So um, I think one of the biggest take homes of the book is um, over the years, I've had many people, uh, uh, many of my personal training clients that would say, I wish I could record our conversation, or I think about the things that um, you say to me all the time. And so um, when people are trying to understand why I don't quote unquote cheat, again, as somebody that is eating everything under the sun, eating every low end junk and every high end junk, um, have been trained professionally as a chef, worked in external one of the top restaurants. Somebody was very addicted to even vegan junk food with why you couldn't pay me to quote unquote cheat, right? So just the insight I find um, is very valuable because I like to, from what I've seen has been the most effective in working with people is when people have light bulb moments. It can really shorten your learning curve. So usually many of us have loads of recipe books, but that's not usually enough to make distinctions between how much food is enough, when we're eating purely for emotions, um, food combinations, how to stretch our money, how to work without um, a recipe. So what you'll find in that book is insight into, I take you with how I got to a point with like many of the other women in my family where i um, we got to 300 pounds. I wasn't 300 pounds, but I was eating like it and eating a lot of food um, emotionally and very addicted to a lot of food, even when I transitioned to health jump. And then um, I'm a very visual person, and I think visuals can shorten the learning curve um, for people. So I took the time to take pictures of um, a lot of the food that I'm preparing. And keep in mind, quite often when I'm preparing food, I will prepare for um, my sister and also my son. Because if I can make sure that they're really enjoying the food, I listen to my family and the feedback. 
So if they're enjoying the food, that lets me know I'm on the right track. If people don't enjoy the food and they feel like we're eating slop and you've just taken everything away, then quite often you can have a mutiny on your hands and your family members will take you down with them and bring all kind of paraphernalia and garbage inside the house. So you want it to be a very um, pleasant um, experience for folks. So that book and my whole take on food and um, some very practical strategies for implementing whole fresh, living, unprocessed foods that are cruelty-free, then the vegan, not getting so caught up in the ego trap of vegan. It's cruelty-free. So that means we're not being um, cruel to animals and not um, consuming all of that cholesterol from the animal products. It's from the whole fresh food, um, which is a big distinction, right? So, but it's not for, we don't need one more thing to divide us. Everyone, no matter what label you call yourself, can benefit from whole, fresh, living, unprocessed plant foods. That's where the majority of the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the, the elements that nourish your body to fortify your body to deal with um, unfriendly bacteria and viruses and the things that cause cancer. That's what the whole, fresh, living, unprocessed plant foods is going to do for you, in addition to it not clogging your body up. So um, those two resources, as well as I have a short and what I call a cheat sheet, um, are available on um, body-culinary.com. Um, for those folks that are interested in coaching, if you'd like um, some guidance in terms of setting up your garden, even if you're in a city, because that's what started in a cold environment, setting up a, a personal movement practice that can include um, you know, things that you can use around your house if you don't have access to gym equipment, using your body weight, things around the house, as well as African dance, which is my um, favorite, um, and really making the um, lifestyle of consuming um, plant-based um, sustainable for the long haul, fitting it into your busy schedule, fitting it into your budget and managing your budget in a way that is really enjoyable and attractive so you don't feel like you have to diet. You can relax and move on and put that focus and that energy to something else, like perhaps travel or economics. Um, I coach people and I teach um, folks um, individually in small groups online. Uh, folks have asked about coming to Central America. I cannot at this time accommodate folks, but if you'd like um, consulting to set up um, a retreat and um, guide you through the process of setting up places to stay locally in the area, um, what are the sites that you'd like to see in Central America, as well as having um, living foods classes. I'm available for that type of consulting. And if you'd like to work through developing your own um, your own recipes and learning how to also prepare food that's unprocessed without even needing a recipe book, then that is um, my specialty. Uh, yes, let me, oh, put your potatoes in the ground, yay! One of my favorite greens is sweet potato greens. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I learned so much from my grandma. I learned so much from just sitting next to her. I talk about my grandma Lou all the time. I talk about my grandma Lou all the time. So there are gardening, um, uh, there are gardening videos on this channel, and there's a puppet, a short puppet series. Um, they're very short, but they're called Sister Butterfly and Sister Monkey Learn to Eat Better. So um, they're politically incorrect, but it's clean enough where children. I um, can see it. Um, it's really butt gusting. <laughs> you really bust the gut laughing at it. But there are 10 um, episodes of the free series, Sister Butterfly and Sister Monkey Learn to Eat Better on the channel. Um, and then I think I have a few, um, a few videos on the things that I'm putting onto my hair and skin. But I think one of the biggest things that um, you can take away, at least from my unique country or my particular contribution is how to make the lifestyle sustainable where you don't feel like you're you're dieting. And then the content um, that I'm working on, it, which is beyond just being vegan, and the label is us being present um, when we're eating, right? Because quite often it's not the food that we're um, looking for. And uh, quite often we're moving at such a pace that not, we're not present. We're on automatic pilot. Um, when it comes to what we're putting in our mouths. And so it's interesting that um, additional adipose tissue or fatty tissue, um, visceral fat that wraps around the organs, which is dangerous, and the adipose, the extra adipose tissue around the midsection, just like our skin is telling us a story. And um, what I'll call emotional calcification, the states of mind that we're in, whether we're anxious, 
sad, angry, nervous. Um, these states of mind that we're in when we're eating on automatic pilot is showing up in our face. So I could give loads of recipes, but a lot of time if we're not getting to the root of our behavior, we can be blaming the exercise didn't work or the quote unquote, the diet didn't work. When in actuality, we may not be distinguishing the states of mind that we're in and all the um, different emotional stuff um, that we're stuffing down with the food. So um, that's quite um, an experiment. And it's a different, it's coming from a different perspective of trying to beat the body into submission with exercise or to just deprive, deprive, de deprive the body. It's a very pleasant it's a pleasant lifestyle, but I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. I can just share my unique experience. And um, this lifestyle is very affordable and it's very sustainable. And so when there are certain things I don't have to um, worry about anymore, I can move on and put that time, energy and focus into something else. <laughs> so thank you for, um, for tuning in. This is Body Culinary sending you all a lot of warm, positive vibes from Central America. I'm going to take a stroll at the market because I'm always inspired to create new um, things at the market and see what's in season. Actually, mangosteen. I don't know if you have ever had mangosteen. Oh my gosh. It is one of the most delicious ambrosic fruits on the planet. It's so delicious. It's a very short season and it's in the market right now. There is a picture of the mangosteen and some of the guava. There's pink and there's white guava, um, but there's a picture of it on my Instagram on Body Culinary. So um, do feel free to go over there and follow on Instagram. All right, folks. So create a great day on purpose and I'll see you again in another video. All right now.